Hi, everyone. Welcome to the CSE February lecture. We are the Center for Climate Science and Engineering at the University of Toronto. I am Daniela Boden, the CSE manager, and we are pleased to feature Dr. Karen Chapel today. So before we get started, I would like to go through the land acknowledgement. So we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Toro Island. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So as I said before, we are the Center for Climate Science and Engineering. We are a research and educational center within the Civil and Mineral Engineering Department at the University of Toronto and established in 2019. So the CSE is made up of seven faculty members who conform the executive team and who participate together in a multidisciplinary research at the intersection of engineering and climate science. I will start with Oya Merkan. Uh, she is the central director and her research focuses on structural analysis. Marianne Hatsopolo focuses on transportation. Paul Kushner looks at climate dynamics. Graham Norval looks at health and safety processes in engineering and chemical engineering. Daniel Posen focuses on life cycle assessment. Karen Smith on atmospheric science. Marianne Tucci on building science. And then me, the CSE manager. So why we work together and what we are trying to do within some of the key activities uh, going on at the CSE Center are education, education about climate science and engineering. From this component, two graduate courses have been developed on top of some online learning models that are about to be completed. The team also works to do research. So the faculty members are carrying out collaborative research projects at the intersection of climate science and engineering. And finally, the team works to do outreach, outreach events like this one, where we invite the public or other university people to come and give a presentation about topics that we feel are aligned with the mandate and the vision we have at the CSE. So as part of these outreach activities, our next guest lecturer is Dr. Kirsten Sigfeld from Simon Fraser University. She is a professor of climate science in the geography department since 10, 2010. And she will be speaking in March about the science of net zero. So we will send you a notice when this event is coming along. But now we are going to get into today's presentation. So I would like to introduce Dr. Karen Chappell. Uh, she is the director of the School of Cities and professor in the Department of Geography and Planning at the University of Toronto. Dr. Chappell studies inequalities in the planning, development, and governance of regions in the US and Latin America, with a focus on economic development and housing. She is a professor emerita of city and regional planning at the University of California, Berkeley where she serves as the department chair and held the Carmel Fraser Chair in Urban Studies. One of her three recent books has won the John Friedman Book Award, and it is titled Planning Sustainable Cities and Regions Towards More Equitable Development. So thanks, Dr. Chapel, for coming. And now I will pass it over to you. Thanks so much for the kind uh, invitation to come. And uh, I'm gonna share my screen now. We all set? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm really delighted to uh, be extending my network to the Center for Climate Science and Engineering. Um, already uh, at the School of Cities, we're working with a number of the faculty um, and we have a, a special, theme for this year on climate and justice. And uh, we found that many of your faculty have similar interests. So, um, so we've been inviting um, people to speak and, and, uh, and having people mentor our students and so forth. So it's been great to have this growing uh, relationship between 
uh, the Center for Climate Science and Engineering and the School of Cities. So um, in that light, I'm gonna talk um, today about an aspect of climate and justice that I've been working on uh, for the last 10 years of my career. It's work that I've done largely in um, California, uh, but it's uh, work that I hope to be bringing to my new life in Canada. Um, as you probably know, California is a global leader in terms of mitigating the impacts of climate change. Um, California uh, was one of the first um, uh, governments to, um, to have a, a mileage per gallon requirement that influenced then the adoption of strict um, uh, uh, fuel efficiency regulations at the federal level. Um, it's, had a, it's pioneered in environmental regulations uh, for for many years and had uh, uh, and now has a, a carbon tax um, and um, and uh, a, a full fledged program to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, uh, below uh, 1990 levels um, and um, so it's it's put a lot of effort into um, making sure we can reduce emissions in, in, in the state and then and, and sort of pushing the boundaries so that uh, to set an example uh, for the rest of the country and the world. Um, it makes it a great place to study. And in fact, um, I began uh, studying um, climate change mitigation in California about a dozen years ago, uh, focusing on the topic of displacement. And so one of the questions that the state of California asked me early on was if we build a lot more transit in the state, if we do bikeways and active transportation and pedestrian improvements and new parks, et cetera, uh, what's going to happen to the existing communities? Um, and the state of California was asking me this question, not because they have a big heart, uh, but because they were afraid of getting sued. Um, and it, it, so it turned out that um, as the state was planning transit stations, and there were 700 transit stations uh, planned uh, in California when we started this research, many have been built now, there's still hundreds more uh, in the planning and, and construction phases. Um, and e each time, they proposed a new transit line, a new transit station. There was community resistance, uh, pushback, lawsuits, et cetera. And so they really wanted to understand when you build a, a new transit line and when you um, have new stations along that line, what happens to the existing community? Uh, do they stay or do they leave? Um, do property values go up? Um, and how far away from the transit is the impact occurring? So this is what I mean by unintended consequences because we're putting in the transit to mitigate climate change. We're putting in the transit to improve accessibility, uh, but are we actually uh, then pushing out communities? So, our focus has always been on, on displacement. Um, and um, we're looking, I'm gonna talk mostly about residential displacement today, but we've also looked at commercial displacement. Um, and this um, uh, displacement in its simplest level is when a household or business is forced to move. So it's involuntary movement. It, it may be because of uh, demolition or fire or natural disaster or maybe uh, uh, a new highway going in or new school being built or it could be economic. It could be that uh, rents are going up, that landlords are able to make more money and raise, uh, raise rents, uh, attracting a new market. Um, so displacement takes uh, many different forms. It's caused by many different factors. Uh, what's important to think about um, for our purposes um, is indirect displacement because there's been a lot of attention paid to direct displacement. You know, if we build a new transit line, um, we have to acquire the right of way um, and that may involve uh, moving households or businesses out. Um, we've done that for years and urban renewal, highway construction and so forth. Um, 
and we 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 compensate. We typically compensate uh, the the people that are displaced. But what if people are not right in the way of the transit line, um, but right next to it, and they still get the negative uh, impacts um, in terms of having uh, rent raised or or uh, construction impacts or what have you. Um, so that this is actually um, it, it's a justice issue that has been ignored uh, generally as we focus much more on on the direct displacement impacts. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, this one case that that um, came to our attention as we started looking at um, California's uh, climate investment program um, and just to frame our thoughts and then I'm going to talk about some quantitative findings in our models. Um, so the the Los Angeles River has gone uh, through a restoration project. Uh, some of you may be aware of this. It's been many, many years. It's been uh, hundreds of millions of dollars and there's been new parks, new bikeways, uh, new transit connections and new housing. Um, and there's been opposition. Um, lots of headlines of folks opposing things. Um, this is the sort of overview of the project you can see um how it's uh it's just it it forms this sort of uh, gateway from the bay from the the pacific ocean into the um into the great uh county of los angeles and um and lots and lots of new green space and amenities planned um it's really a beautiful example of river restoration um yet it has pissed off a lot of uh community activists of over many years um who uh, felt like this restoration was exacerbating conditions of gentrification and displacement occurring in nearby neighborhoods. So um, many, there's been housing market a crunch for decades in this region. People have had the rents going up, many have lost their homes. And um, as they see these new uh, greening improvements meant to mitigate climate change in part, um, they, they are, um, are uh, resistant um, and angry. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is a typical quote that we got from an organizer from a Southeast Asian group. Um, you see beautiful renderings of parks. Um, our students were saying, where are we in all this? My family are garment workers. We make 15,000 a year. Rents are, are more than we make. Where are we gonna go? Should we fight or do we give up? We can't say no but we can't assume uh, that saying yes to parks means gentrification and displacement. So there has to be a third option. So the, the community has fought for years to find another way, um, uh, another a way that they can actually have the beauty and, and stay in the community. Um, when we looked at the, what was actually going on um, in terms of uh, population change near the LA River over the decades, uh, we actually don't see much evidence of displacement. So even though the community on the ground um, is very concerned about people being pushed out, if you could see the bottom line here, the dotted line is, is the move outs. Um, it's the number of move outs over time next to the Los Angeles Re River. We have a panel uh, data set, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and that so move outs over time have, have increased slightly, but actually they've gone down. And meanwhile, um, the, the um, overall population has just gone up. So more people are moving in, uh, but without people moving out. Um, and um, so the blue line is everybody in the neighborhoods nearby the river and the, the yellow line is the low income renters. Um, so even low income renter families are moving up, moving, uh, increasing in number. Um, so it's really interesting that this, you know, the numbers contradict um, the feelings of the community on the ground. Um, and I, I have a, I'm not going to talk about this any, any more today, it's just sort of to illustrate the problem, but, but so interesting um, that, you know, I, and I believe one of our hypotheses is that you, you see new people in your neighborhood and you kind of, uh, assume everybody is getting pushed out, but but it's it's not quite uh, true. The neighborhood is changing uh, slowly, but um, um, and perhaps some are getting some are getting pushed out, but the numbers are not very high. So we sought to really look at this and really establish it through 
a more systematic study. Um, I um, I just wanted to to kind of frame where we're where we're coming from um, with this delightful piece that just came out in the annals of the American Association of Geographers on on green uh, green gentrification and urban greening and and ways we think about we think about justice um, with it. Um, and, um, um, you know, there's, there are considerations of distribution, the fact that, that some people are living nearby these amenities and some are not, so they're unevenly distributed. Um, there's also sort of a symbolic, uh, or what they're calling here an interactional re recognition justice, or this issue that, that we often privilege the types of large infrastructure projects or park projects uh, that don't speak to low-income communities of color um, that are really, um, you know, a classic example is the High Line in, in uh, Manhattan. It's, it's, it, there is, it's not grounded in any community or culture. It's, it's a, a, a kind of a symbolic amenity for, to represent post-industrial uh, New York. Um, and so that could make people feel excluded. And then there's participatory justice, the third kind, um, which is, you know, this issue of who's getting to decide what are the improvements to, to go in. And um, I would argue that, um, you know, in the, in the end, um, this is probably the most important thing for us to address. If we want to move on from these stalemates about um, climate change mitigations, we're going to have to uh, find some way to, to give voice um, to underrepresented communities. So um, let me talk briefly about the, how we got here and then I'll go into some numbers because that's the fun part and maybe fun for you guys too. So, um, so it, you know, when we, the context here, the historical context here, when we do our climate uh, change mitigation improvements, whether we're talking about new transit or or new parks, um, you know, we're building on um, the past hundred years uh, of urban renewal interventions. Um, and this is, of course, is the famous uh, Lincoln Center uh, improvement. Um, you can see the, the ballet dancers there and Robert Moses in New York, um, where so much of this uh, occurred, uh, the scale in New York was beyond anything else. But, you know, planners are still dealing with this and engineers too, are still dealing with this legacy of we, we did these top-down interventions into the communities. We displaced hundreds of thousands. The counts are, are you know, there's, a, there's about a million just from Interstate Highway Act in, in, um, in, the, U, uh, in the U.S. Um, and another million from urban renewal. It's a lot of people. I mean, you think that those, that knowledge and that mistrust of government gets passed down. Um, and then, you know, we come back to these same communities and we say we want to build transit. Um, and it's it's very contentious. Um, there's also a, been a lot of talk about the gentrification that happens um, in in these very same neighborhoods. So after we did all the urban renewal um, and the middle class poured out, the middle class came back in. Um, and um, a lot of this uh, literature is pointing out that this is happening all over the world and, and um, whether we're talking about North America or Latin America or Asia or Europe, you're seeing this um, gentrification in the heart of the city. Um, and then most recently, um, the talk has turned to green gentrification. Um, and, the, uh, and, and so the latest kind of um, pushback against gentrification arguably is about um, all the numerous transit lines going up all over the world, um, the bikeways, um, the, the uh, green belts and so forth. So this is what I call a uh, double jeopardy. So people feel like, well, first I was in danger because my neighborhood was gentrifying. I thought I was going to lo lose my house. And now I'm in danger because you put in a bikeway as well. Um, so uh, so this, is the, this is what people are experiencing on the ground. Um, so now I want to turn to some numbers um, and think about uh, this generally this program of climate change mitigation. Um, and this is the California program, but there's a similar program in, in Canada and in the EU and so forth. Um, so this is this is um, where the emissions come from in California. Um, they, or to the California Air Resources Board talks about it by sector typically. Um, so commercial residential buildings are actually the smallest piece 
Um, and transportation is, is just a uh, mammoth in the state of California in terms of greenhouse gas emissions because of the, in part, um, the dependency on the automobile in that very uh, sprawling auto oriented urban form. Um, industrial and electric power are other issues. And this is about the, the grid, um, which ha, you know is often driven by coal and uh, dirty fuel. Um, I have wildfire in here too because I often give my. I have a wildfire study as well, and that's that's been an, another kind of compounding effect on, on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so this is the problem we're trying to address. This is why um, the state of California, when it looks at how it's going to um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, has really focused on transportation. Um, and these are the types of programs um, that have been funded. So there's a, a set of uh, programs called California Climate Investments, which are uh, looking at ways to uh, build, bring more transportation, land use, um, uh, smart growth type development to, to local communities, um, suburban communities, um, to rehabilitate <laughs> the, the suburban sprawl by adding bikeways and um, pedestrian um, and other types of infrastructure improvements. So this is, this is uh, programs um, from the parks department, from the transportation department, from the housing uh, and community development department. So these are across the state of California, there's a there's a tremendous portfolio of climate investments, and this is all being mobilized to reduce green greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so that's what we set out to study. Um, so we took these climate investments and we were able to identify about 1,400 of them, um, um, 23 billion of direct funding from the state, 173 billion um, in the um, overall project co cost. And this was just looking at three regions, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Fresno. Um, we, we look then at active transportation, so bike facilities, complete streets, we looked at transit, um, we, looked at, um, we looked at infill housing, which um, is a piece I'm not going to talk about today, but we looked at that as well, um, and then we looked at parks. Um, and so uh, we identified these investments. Um, uh, we went to a number of communities to uh, to discuss them, to to um, to uh, discuss the cases, and to to um, to uh, to ground truth the results at the end of our study. Um, we used um, InfoGroup proprietary data. This is a database um, that you can purchase um, in the United States that has uh, individual household uh, data uh, over over a period of. Uh, 13 years, it tells you where, what the, the income, race, ethnicity, household composition, uh, housing type, tenure, um, and, uh, and mobility, um, where the house, where the house lived. Um, it's, it's proprietary, da da proprietary data that is, you know, produced by credit card companies. Um, they're all uh, trying to figure out where their customers are and what they're going to spend on. So they've developed these databases and then they're selling them to to researchers. Um, so this data um, took us actually a year to clean. Um, I don't recommend anybody buying InfoGroup data. We'll never do it again. Um, several of us nearly um, jumped off a cliff in the process of cleaning the data, um, but it's great data once it's clean. So um, what we did um, again was, was um, you know, produce some descriptive statistics. We did a, a propensity score matching, um, which I'll show you our match process. And then we ran linear probability models. And this was all to predict displacement rates that we're looking at how, uh, what, uh, what are the displacement rates um, in the places with the investment versus the places without. Um, so let me uh, give you an idea of how we, how we did this. Um, so in all of these, um, graphics I'm about to show you. Uh, we had investment neighborhoods in light green and control neighborhoods in dark green. The investment neighborhoods had transit investments, they had active transportation investments, or they had parks. Um, so again, 1400 investments. Um, so all of these, these are census tracts colored in light green. That's where all of our investments were located. 
Um, then we had to find matched pairs for our control neighborhoods in dark green. Um, and so we had a, um, uh, a, you know, we looked at several key variables to match on income, race and ethnicity, age of the urban form, um, among others, um, used a propensity score matching process to identify the best matches. Um, then, then the hard part was actually, uh, we had to make sure that there weren't uh, investments like parks, transit investments, et cetera, that were recent in the match tracks. So that's where um, we had to actually kind of go manually, look at maps, look at uh, Google Street View, um, just to make sure that our controls were not contaminated with investments. Um, so that was another year um, doing that to clean the data. Um, so then uh, we had our we had our results, and so I'll show you a set of charts that depict what we found. So again, the dark green is the control, the light green is the investments. Um, so um, looking in different regions, um, we saw different uh, patterns. So on the in the left, the two panels are Los Angeles and Fresno. Um, mixed income um, areas in the south and, and center of California. On the right are Bay Area and Sacramento, uh, more affluent um, regions in the north of California. Um, in the north, in those northern neighborhoods in the right panels, you'll see that the controls, the control neighborhoods generally had higher out migration rates. Um, so the, our, our um, hypothesis that you know investment these investments would push uh, displacement higher uh, was not uh, true overall in those in the Bay Area and Sacramento areas um, in the southern areas however um, the out, out migration rates um, were were higher for the investment so if you had if you got the transit line or active transportation or park uh, you were slightly more likely um, to move out in a particular year. So this is looking at, again, household out migration rates in a, in a typical year, 10% of households move out. Um, and uh, you'll see it's, it's about 1% or 0.5 to 1% higher um, if there's a investment in your tract. I'm see, um, somebody wants to speak. Uh, if, if you, um, I'll let the moderator say, okay, she says, wait for the Q&A. Yeah. So, um, so, um, so then we looked at it by income to see um, if there are differences. Um, and we looked at um, uh, different types of income groups um, and compared again, the investment tracks with the light green. Um, with the uh, controls in the dark green um, and found that really for um, all different income groups, it, they were quite similar patterns of out, out migration uh, rates. Um, in, for, but for, for, um, for certain lower income groups, the out migration rate is slightly higher uh, with, with uh, these types of climate investments. So then we looked at uh, the probabilities of out migration um, for lower income renters um, it, using uh, linear probability models. Um, and we had year and region fixed effects um, to examine this. And so here we, we broke it down into transit um, investments uh, versus active transportation and green investments. Um, we had to uh, combine active transportation and green investments because we didn't have a big enough sample size to look at them separately. So um, let's look at the left pan set of panels first. Those are the transit investments. Um, so comparing again the controls um, to the um, investment areas, the light green, you'll see that the, it's higher if you're very low income or low income, um, um, particularly the very low income. The extremely low income groups actually have lower out migration rates. And we believe that's because many have subsidized housing and so they're able to stay in place. Um, and it's the same thing on the right set of panels with the active transportation and green uh, improvements that it's slightly uh, higher displacement rates for um, 
um, for very low um, and low income groups when there is an investment uh, in the in the neighborhood. So what does slightly mean? Um, you know, so if you in a normal year, um, you would have um, say 87 uh, people, uh, low income, very low income households uh, moving out per thousand um, uh, or, or seven, if, if you would have uh, without the investment, 79 moving out, um, you, with the investment, you would have 87 of a thousand. So, so that means eight extra households displaced out of a thousand. Um, and um, this was really revealing to us um, for, for certain reasons. Um, this, it was the first time anybody had actually kind of put a number to it. And once you put a number to it, you can really see that there, there is an impact for certain groups and it should be mitigable if you uh, enact anti-displacement policies, um, different types of uh, affordable housing policies like inclusionary housing. So I'm going to um, uh, talk briefly about what these uh, policy implications are and then I'll wrap up. Um, so the out migration effects of climate are small um, and contextually specific. We found very different impacts in different um, regions. We found different impacts depending on the type of uh, infrastructure. We found different impacts um, depending on the neighborhood and neighborhood characteristics. Um, and um, uh, so that, you know, there's, um, you probably have to dig much further to understand whether in your particular neighborhood is the new transit system going to displace uh, residents. Um, the, the size of these impacts suggests that they are mitigable. Um, and um, as we talk to communities, um, you know, we found a, a great interest in doing more uh, preservation of affordable housing when we're when we're building new parks or transit, um, investing in in um, in um, maybe acquiring uh, buildings, putting them into public sector hands, and keeping them permanently affordable. Um, another way this could be done is by community land trusts putting um, uh, the um, land into community ownership um, and uh, allowing homeowners to have. Uh, home equity um, or shared equity type models. Um, so those are some of the ideas we heard from communities that we talked to. What was clear was that each community had a different idea what they wanted um, for themselves. Um, and um, so that leads to the idea that, that they would really need to co-design, co-create um, the mitigations that we come up with. Um, even though this research was, we were able to look at a 15-year period, mobility over a 15-year period, um, we don't really know much about the long-term impacts. And it could be that the real impacts unfold 30 years later or 50 years later. That's sort of something that we've seen with, with urban renewal, where some of the impacts from um, the urban renewal in the 1950s are playing out many, many uh, years later. Um, so that, you know, it, without knowing much about that, um, we, we really see that it's important to keep the community in, uh, organized and empowered um, in, order, um, in order to be prepared as the market picks up around these improvements. So with that said, what we, what we um, ended the project with was, was the creation of a tool um, and the tool um, is uh, basically a, a way for to map investments. Those, those are, for instance, here the green lines that you see here. This is a map of the Bay Area, um, and the green lines are transit investments and park improvements. And um, what we do uh, in the tool is we show um, how the communities are changing around those investments. So people can see for themselves um, in a certain time period and looking at different income groups, um, who's moving in and who's moving out. So this is um, looking in this particular example, looking at low income groups, um, 50 to 80% of area median income and um, and we're seeing that they are um, 
the areas in blue are where um, they're being displaced. Um, they're they're uh, having to move out. Um, and where uh, areas in gold is where that low income group is increasing. Um, so we're, we, with tools like this, um, the you know communities can raise the awareness of their policymakers, their local councils, um, about the need for tools and policies to stabilize uh, the area. Um, so we have um, a, a set of maps up. We have a website, urbandisplacement.org, where we put these uh, tools for communities. Uh, this one is not launched yet, uh, but will be launched uh, next month. Um, and what we found is that, uh, is, is that people are using these tools uh, to advocate in public fora. They're bringing the maps. Uh, this man is showing uh, a map of his neighborhood showing uh, that uh, we've established in our maps that displacement's occurring and he's trying to make a case um, in San Jose, in this case, um, to his counselors to please um, enact some um, stronger rent protections, stronger tenant protections so that they'll be able to stay um, as, as in this case, a, a Google campus comes. So with that, I'll um, end and uh, open it up to questions.